So yeah, welcome everyone to this um, webinar. This is our fourth webinar of the series, the extension agent of the future. And the topic today will be analytics, how collective digital data can be turned into actionable data-driven agronomy insights. Uh, my name is Berta Ortiz and I am the coordinator of the community of practice in data-driven agronomy from the Big Data Platform. And I will be here together with David, making sure that everything runs smoothly. I would like to remind you that if you have any questions during the webinar, you can put them in the question and answer box. Um, please not in the chat box because otherwise it becomes a bit difficult for us to manage them. So yeah, please use the question and answer box. Uh, the link of the recording will be shared through our social media channels and the webpage of the community of practice. Uh, and yeah. During this session, our moderators, David and Daniel, will give us more introduction to the topic. Then our two speakers will give the presentations. And at the end, we will have time for questions and discussion. So now without further delay, I will pass on into David and Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Berta. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Jimenez, the leader of the community of practice on data during agronomy. And I'm very pleased to see you all attending. Uh, just to remind you that this community of practice operates under the CGIR platform for big data in agriculture. And uh, one of the main goals of the community of practice is to facilitate and communicate collective action around topics related to data during agronomy. So a little bit of context, uh, a year ago, and as a result of previous activities carried out by this community of practice, we proposed to the community to elaborate on the topic related to what are the skills, attitudes, and knowledge uh, that an extension agent should have. So with the participation of more than 300 colleagues and during the Big Data in Agriculture Convention that, was, that, were, that went virtually last year, we got like dozens of ideas on which angles and aspects should be explored related to, to the extension agent of the future. So based on such feedback, this year we've been organizing several webinars related to this topic. We already talked about the human-centered design and how to understand better the needs of farmers and extension officers. In our second webinar, we talk about access and the tools accessible to different cultures and languages. Then we organize our third webinar on delivery and what are the trade-offs and synergies between digital delivery models and more traditional participatory research methods. And today we're going to have our fourth webinar on analytics and the role of these, of the analytics, providing decision support to extension programs, for example, and how to turn data into actionable advice, uh, thinking of for, of, for instance, what analytical tool is most appropriate to create context-specific content. And, and to be honest, uh, analytics is a topic that, that kind of warms our, I mean, De David and I hearts, uh, because we both have backgrounds in agronomy and analytics, so we hope you will enjoy it as much as David and, David and I we will do. I stop there and I hand over to David so he can introduce himself, uh, the topic in our first speaker. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so my name is David Guerena and I'm a scientist with the Big Data Platform at the CGIAR. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here with you all. As Danielle said, uh, this topic is you know, kind of close to both of us given our technical background. And when we've been thinking about the different components of the extension into the future, one of them is how can we look at leveraging analytics to provide decision support systems for uh, smallholder farmers or even farming community in general. And uh, we had a great pleasure of having some wonderful and, uh, and very progressive data scientists, both within the CG and outside the CG. Uh, so we felt that this would be a great opportunity to be able to, to showcase a lot of the interesting work that they're doing. So then I have the great pleasure of introducing Alice uh, Laborte. So Alice is a senior scientist and the research unit leader of the spatial transformations of landscapes at the International Rice Research Institute. And Alice leads a multidisciplinary team with expertise in GIS, remote sensing, crop modeling, ICT, and social science. Her research focuses on the use of spatial information to generate evidence, actionable information, and insights from policy, research, prioritization, and effective targeting and scaling of the technological innovations. And uh, we had a great uh, introductory meeting with Alice a couple of months ago where she was highlighting a lot of these really impactful programs she was leading that have actually been able to influence uh, government policy in the Philippines and beyond. So uh, with that, uh, please, Alice, uh, over to you.
can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Uh, good day, good evening. I'm pleased to share with you our work at the International Rice Research Institute in partnership with various institutions um, in uh, developing and institutionalizing digital solutions to um, support data-driven agricultural decision-making. I will be talking about three digital agricultural innovations at various stages of development. Um, and these are all funded by the Philippine Department of Agriculture, a National Rice Program, and the Bureau of Agricultural Research. And involves close collaboration with the DA regional field offices and national research organizations. So the Philippine Rice Research uh, the Philippine Rice Information System, or PRISM, is a satellite-based national rice monitoring system, which has been operational since mid-2018. The second is the Rice Crop Manager, or RCM, which is a web and mobile platform that provides farmers with field-specific recommendations. So just last week, this was transitioned to the Department of Agriculture. And finally, PRIME, or the Pest Risk Identification and Management, is a web-based application providing pre-semester and within-semester pest advisories based on data from pest surveillance um, to mitigate yield losses due to major pests and diseases. And a sustainability plan for its continued operation is being developed, and this will be transitioned to the Bureau of Plant Industry, which has the mandate for pest surveillance and monitoring in the country. So first, I'm going to talk about PRISM. So PRISM uses remote sensing, crop modeling, and smartphone-based surveys and web platforms to deliver actionable information on rice crop seasonality, production, and damages due to flood and drought. Information in response to questions such as where rice is grown, where, when it is planted, and how much rice is produced will support policymakers and planners in making decisions related to food security that will benefit smallholder rice farmers and consumers. We are mapping rice area using time series Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar and a rule-based rice detection algorithm. Trained regional partners armed with a smartphone monitor over 1,000 fields throughout the country to know what is happening on the ground and also to collect data for validating the resulting maps. Rice yield is estimated using the crop growth simulation model, RISA, which requires as input weather, soil, uh, crop specific parameters, and management practices to simulate yield. Sim satellite imagery is an additional input uh, to be able to estimate mid-season forecasts and end of season yields. Here are some of the products generated regularly by PRISM. High resolution maps of rice areas such as the one uh, you see on the left have been generated uh, since 2015 with accuracies above 90% in recent years. Information when rice is planted is important as this is useful in knowing in advance delays in rice supply and potential shortfall in rice production. The map uh, on your right shows locations where yields are low. So the red areas uh, are where yields are only two to three tons per hectare. And these are where productivity enhancing technologies and programs are needed the most. Data provided by PRISM are available two months earlier and much more detailed than official statistics. In the event of a flood or drought, a rapid assessment is done to identify affected rice areas. The map on the left um, shows in red the rice areas that were flooded as a result of a super typhoon that hit the country last year. Now, looking at several years of data also allows us to identify where the flood-prone rice areas are. The map on your right is a compilation of the different uh, typhoon assessments or flood assessments that have been done from 2014 to 2020. And the orange to red areas are those that were flooded at least 10 times in seven years. 
And these are the areas where technologies such as flood tolerant rice varieties that are developed by our breeders need to be targeted. Suprism so has been institutionalized in the Philippines since mid 2018, following co-development, capacity building, and proof of value addition. PRISM has been providing the government with monthly data on rice area and mid-season and end-of-season yield estimates and damage assessments in the event of a flood or drought. Various local government units are using PRISM data for their municipal development plans, as well as for planning for procurement of seeds and targeting of interventions to help improve productivity and income of rice farmers. Now, PRISM has been designed to support decision-making at the level of policymakers and planners. The next digital tool I will present is the Rice Crop Manager, or RCM, which is a digital tool that supports a farm, that provides farmers with individualized crop and nutrient management recommendations to increase their yield and income from rice farming. First, farmers are interviewed about their rice crop prior to crop establishment by government agricultural extension workers. On the basis of this interview, crop management recommendations are generated using RCM and provided to farmers in the form of a one-page printout. If the farmer registers his mobile phone number during the interview, um, he will also receive a reminder about the recommendations in the form of a SMS or a short message service. Now, RCM has been expanded to cover, to include other tools. Uh, for, uh, one is for registering the farmer and their farm lots, um, measuring farm lots using GPS for exact recommendation of inputs. Uh, a monitoring system is also included to monitor uptake of inputs and uh, data analytics and reports provided to the Department of Agriculture. Um, the recommendations include the amount and kind of fertilizer to be applied, the timing of fertilizer application during the critical growth stage of the rice crop, and other uh, crop management recommendations like weed management, water management, pest application. And the information is provided during the early stages of rice growth for each field that the farmer uh, registered. As of July this year, uh, the 2.7 million RCM recommendations have been generated since 2014, um, reaching a total of 1.4 million farmers. Based on an external monitoring and evaluation commissioned by uh, the Department of Agriculture, 58% of farmer respondents affirmed that they followed most of the RCM recommendations. Um, gaining uh, additional income of $200 per hectare per season. So these are some uh, testimonials of rice farmers gaining a uh, higher yield and higher income, and also extension workers who have been using RCM to provide uh, advisory to farmers. So I'll now talk about uh, the Pest Risk Identification Management, or PRIME, which aims to mitigate crop losses due to pests and diseases. As part of PRIME, we developed a standard protocol for pest surveillance and trained regional partners using this protocol, collect data throughout the country um, and collect monthly pest data in a total of 2,700 monitoring fields throughout the country. And this is our basis for generating pre-season pest bulletins on the pest situation and advisories to support uh, extension agents. Uh, the monthly pest surveillance data also serve as basis for pest alerts in case of elevated observations during the monthly monitoring an email, um, this alert triggers uh, verification on the ground to assess extent of areas affected and to mobilize support for farmers as needed. An email is automatically sent to the Department of Agriculture offices uh, requiring such information, including the Assistant Secretary for Operations and the Regional Crop Protection Centers. 
So our modelers are also developing risk maps for brown plant hopper, blast, and bacterial blight, which are major rice pests. These models are under development and plans for validation of results uh, are underway. So I presented uh, briefly three digital innovations implemented in the Philippines to support decision making on different aspects of rice production and at different decision scales by interoperating both the tools and the databases that they are linked on rice farmers and agricultural extension workers will have more sophisticated layered data on which to make better evidence-based decisions for example rcm can be improved to use a prism mid-semester yield forecast to provide fertilizer recommendations adjustments within season, in addition to pre-season recommendations it currently provides. RCM can also facilitate early warning pest advisories reaching farmers or farmer groups in a timely manner. And making these tools interoperable will facilitate near real-time data sharing and improve efficiency and the quality of information available to support farm decisions. Here are some key lessons on developing and institutionalizing uh, digital solutions. So ownership is key to sustainability. Um, this requires co-development, regular communication, and joint decision-making. Identify key stakeholders and partners and plan how to engage them and involve them early. Institutionalization requires dedicated staff and budget allocated to the agency that will continue operation beyond project life. And this requires high level support to happen. And that means they have to be involved early on. Uh, next, establish confidence in the accuracy and timeliness of product delivery and clearly demonstrate value addition. And finally, build capacity to generate and use products and sustain the system. It's not enough for them to be able to generate products on, on their own, for example, in, as in PRISM, and they should also be trained on how to use products to improve a decision making. So I presented some of our work in partnership with these organizations, leveraging digital solutions to support data-driven agricultural decision-making for improved security in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. <clears throat> Great presentation. So we will wrap up at the end, but you know, I, I have even some questions. But, but, but very happy to see this, you know, CGR initiative and, and how long uh, and how far it, it, it got. So now I'll introduce uh, Matt Miller. Uh, so, so Matt, he's uh, from IISDA. So he this is the lead data scientist. So from those who are not familiar with ISDA uh, yet, let me tell you that they are the ones who have developed this app or tool called the Virtual Agronomist, which use pretty cool layers of information and nice resolution to ultimately provide recommendations on crop yield and fertilizer rate and, and even formulation at different scales. So over to you, Matt. All right, thank you. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen shout if not. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Matt Miller. I'm lead data scientist here at ISDA um, and as, as was mentioned, some of you may not know us, we're uh, Innovative Solutions for Decision Agriculture. Um, and we were um, basically created to uh, provide agronomy solutions um, for smallholder farmers initially starting in Africa. So uh, I'm just basically going to give you um, our take on how we've converted digital data into agronomy insights, or in our case, um, products. So uh, first, a bit of history on ISDA. We were um, spun out of the AFSIS project, so the African Soil Information Service. Um, this was a uh, project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, lasted about 10 years and kind of revolutionized uh, data collection and um, analysis of soil data at scale. And our challenge um, in the conclusion of that project was to really uh, 
keep these outputs going and um, commercialize them. So turn them into um, kind of financially sustainable um, products and services. Um, so we're a fully commercial company, but we also have a, a very strong um, social mission, which is to improve um, smallholder profitability. So that's kind of our, our MO. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk you through uh, some of our products and resources, uh, some of which have already been mentioned. So um, to start with, I just want to kind of frame the problem I'm talking about uh, today. So this isn't the only problem we're trying to solve, but it's one I'll focus on today. And that is that there aren't enough agronomists. So, um, and I'm talking about uh, Africa in general here. Um, so although the situation varies between countries, this is a, a general rule that um, many smallholder farmers don't have timely access to an agronomist. So our solution to this is to augment extension agents with digital tools which can combine expert knowledge, AI and big data. So this means that this slightly lower skilled agent can then perform some of these agronomy type functions in the absence of an agronomist. So we're not replacing any human element here more, we're just um, extending the capabilities of extension agents. Um, and at the moment, we're, our model is to work through pre-existing networks that have already been developed. So uh, companies and organizations who have this network of extension agents, maybe they're aggregators or cooperatives, uh, we use their agents um, to deliver advisory to the farmers. And our initial um, products to do this is called the Virtual Agronomist. So it's a nutrient management tool, um, which is robust under uncertain data. Um, I'll also spend a bit of time telling you about ISTA soil. So this is our digital um, soil map, which covers Africa at 30 meter resolution. And although these are standalone products, um, as you may imagine, uh, ISTA soil actually feeds into the virtual agronomist in order for it to give a fertilizer recommendation. Um, so ISTA soil, uh, just a bit of background. There's many reasons why we created ISTA soil, but one of the main reasons really was um, we needed soil information for every farm in Africa. Um, and generally, um, lab-based soil tests are too expensive for smallholder farmers to afford. They can cost between, say, 50, uh, 30 and $50. Um, so we needed a solution that was uh, a lot cheaper than that. Um, so we created ISTA soil, which is completely free and open access. Um, to predict soil properties across every field. Um, sure, it's not going to be as accurate as a lab-based test, but it's, it's definitely better than having no information. So how we um, created is to soil, we used over 100,000 analyzed soil samples um, across a, uh, various data sets. And then we train machine learning algorithms um, using a quite extensive uh, stack of covariates to predict the soil properties. So this included high resolution satellite data, so Landsat, Sentinel-2 data, etc., uh, a digital elevation model and a number of uh, different climate maps, for example, temperature and rainfall, things like that. And we generated predictions for over 24 billion locations, which is um, what you get if you do kind of uh, cropland areas or uh, potential agricultural areas at 30 meters across Africa. Um, as I mentioned, it's completely open access, um, so anyone's free to use it, and it powers um, our agronomic advisory tools, so the virtual agronomist, which I'll talk about afterwards. Uh, and importantly, we don't want this to be like a one-time thing. We don't want it to become stale. Um, it's a living resource, and we're planning on uh, running an update of it next year. So we want it to stay up to date with, you know, latest developments in uh, machine learning algorithms or improvements in satellite technology, but also um, for when people have additional soil data they want to share. Um, so please, if anyone has some soil data for Africa, um, please share it with us so we can improve these maps. Um, so this is just a quick map to show the locations of um, the soil data training points that we use, uh, and the majority of which came from uh, the AFSIS project that I mentioned. So I don't have time to give you an interactive demo, but here's some screen grabs to hopefully give you a flavor of the of what we've created uh, for ISTA soil. So we've made maps for over 20 different soil properties. Uh, this screen grab you can see here is pH. Uh, two different soil depths. Uh, we published the um, approach we used in Nature Scientific Reports. And all of our um, soil predictions uh, include uncertainty. So for basically for any location, you can get a uh, predicted soil property, but also um, a standard deviation to give a measure of how, how confident that prediction is. 
this is a map of uncertainty for the same location. So in including uncertainty data, we can make uh, kind of risk-based recommendations. And you'll see that that's kind of a, a key feature that underpins everything we do. Um, so yeah, in this map, yellow is uh, more certain predictions and blue is less certain. And you can see if I scroll between them, the patterns are actually very different between the SIP predicted properties and the uncertainty. So we might see, for example, the same property, uh, the same value for pH is predicted at two different locations, but the uncertainty is massively different. So we might make uh, different advisory approaches for those areas that have higher uncertainty, um, namely a, a less risky approach. Um, and the uncertainty varies depending on the location. So generally we see that for um, locations where we have a high density of training points, the uncertainty is lower. Um, we've also created these for, uh, soil fertility constraint maps. So this is the fertility capability classifications, kind of um, our attempt to bring this data towards a more decision ready information. Um, so it, it basically um, predicts locations where we're likely to have um, soil constraints that might want to be addressed before applying fertilizer. So just things like aluminium toxicity or high erosion risk. Um, access. So we made considerable effort to make sure that this is completely open and usable for the community. Um, it's under a CC BY 4.0 license, so you can basically do what you want with it. Um, you can browse the maps um, on the ISTASOL homepage on our website. So that's where uh, these screen grabs come from. Um, you can also sign up for our free API um, that allows you to um, query uh, the maps by lat long to retrieve soil information. Uh, we've loaded the data into Google Earth Engine, so that allows you to analyze our data alongside all the other great data sets they have there. And um, finally, it's also loaded into uh, Amazon Web Services Registry of Open Data. So this is a completely free uh, service. Uh, imagine it's kind of like a, um, a file server, basically. So you can download the actual files themselves. And the cool thing about um, these files is that you can actually request um, uh, information for specific geographies. So you don't have to download the entire files, which can kind of run into the tens of gigabytes. You can just get it for your specific geography of interest. Um, that concludes your kind of whistle-stop tour of uh, ISDA soil. There's plenty more detail, but hopefully that gives you a flavor going back to the uh, kind of subject of this seminar that um, this is our first step really uh, from turning digital data into insights. So we've taken a, a set of soil observations at specific locations, and then we've created these maps in, which incorporate all the satellite information to predict on a kind of consistent geospatial basis, which then provides us um, soil information for any location, which can feed into um, any advisory services we'd like to give, such as the virtual agronomist. Um, so this is our smartphone app, um, and it's for uh, nutrient recommendations. Um, so here's a, here's a screen grab here. Again, don't have time for a demo, but it, it is working, I promise. Um, uh, the, so the first application of the, the virtual agronomist um, is fertilizer recommendation, um, but we plan to expand it. Um, and it uses decision science principles um, and encodes expert knowledge about site-specific nu nutrient management. So the underlying technology here is a Bayesian network, and that basically allows us um, to model things with distributions rather than values. So it allows us to convey uh, risk and uncertainty associated with with any decisions, which is um, quite an important part for many farmers. So it provides um, a recommendation for fertilizer rate and formulation based upon a, a realistic target yield. So it doesn't at any point actually ask the farmer what yield they would like to achieve. It calculates it based upon uh, other data, including the, um, the yields they have achieved previously and their propensity for risk. And also the expected profit is presented. So again, this is presented as a range. Um, so farmers can kind of see like the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. Um, importantly, it's, it's interactive. So farmers can ask the what if questions. So what if I won the lottery and I wanted to make a really risky investment because I had a lot more money? How would that um, impact my expected profit? So they can kind of play with 
um, the, the options to see which recommendation actually suits them the most in terms of the balance of, of risk and cost. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's at this stage not a smartphone app for the farmers themselves. Uh, the primary audience is extension agents who then um, visit the, um, the farmers to deliver the advisory. Uh, just to note that although this is a smartphone app, it, it can be technology agnostic. So we could, for example, in future, uh, white label this out to um, different companies who, or other people who already have their platform. So we could integrate with platforms. Maybe we'll look at direct to farmer ultimately, but at this stage, we're, we're delivering it in this manner. And you can see from this screen grab, these are toggle buttons. So you don't have to enter an unfertilized yield or a current yield if the farmer doesn't know it. So as I mentioned before, it's, it's robust under uncertain data. Um, and it's built on the available data that we could get from um, surveys and literature values, et cetera. But this actually functions as a data collection tool as well as a recommendation tool. So it can learn from the data from, for example, these values of yields that have been input and ultimately become uh, self-improving. So just to give you an idea of the decision network under the hood uh, for the virtual agronomist, it basically um, uses the farmer information. So yield information, manure history, uh, any diseases, um, also some, some climate information and pest and disease, um, and also forecasts. All this feeds into an attainable uh, yield figure. And then this also incorporates the soil information. So as I mentioned before, this, um, Virtual agronomist is integrated with ISDA soil, but it doesn't necessarily have to use ISDA soil. So if the farmer, um, for example, has uh, data from a handheld spectral scanner for their field or even a lab uh, wet chemistry analysis, they can input that data instead. But at least with ISDA soil, we know we always have soil data. So all of this feeds into a fertilizer investment, uh, which includes uh, the farmer risk preference. So if they're, for example, want to make more risky or a less risky investment, so the output of this is uh, an MPK um, ratio and an amount. And then we, the other part of the virtual agronomist is the fertilizer product optimizer. So this is uh, something we've recently added. And from an available list of fertilizer products, this actually optimizes based upon the price. Uh, so the specific blend that's recommended to the farmer. We've actually also included uh, the option of blending more than one product. Uh, so make, getting the desired MPK ratio for more than one product. And we've actually found if you increase the number of products from one to two or three, that can actually get a, um, a cost saving for the farmers of up to 50%. So ultimately this feel, feeds into a yield response um, and a profit, which obviously includes the prices. Um, and as I mentioned before, so this profit, um, farmers can see how the profit is affected if they uh, modify their risk preference and also importantly a lot of farmers are, are risk averse so it includes the chance of loss so the farmers can see um, based upon um, their risk preference how what their chance of loss is so they can get a um, recommendation that they're comfortable with so there's a lot of potential improvements that um, can be done and we ultimately plan for this to go beyond just fertilizer recommendations so for example, there's a uh, yield constraint diagnosis, uh, farm activity based upon hyperlocal weather, pest and disease uh, analysis, and also blend optimization, which we've started to do already. And as you can probably guess, we're kind of a lot earlier on than for example, Alice has just presented. Um, so we're looking for um, partners uh, to inform basically this roadmap of what, um, of how we expand the, the product. And, so it's not definitely necessarily driven by our academic interests, it's driven by the people who ultimately want to use and pay for this product. Um, so I just wanted to uh, finish really by highlighting a couple of uh, points about how our process might be different from, for example, a, a typical um, uh, research project approach to developing a tool, um, given that we're kind of more um, uh, commercial than pure research. Um, so the important thing we did first was develop a minimal working version. Um, seeing an app is, is very powerful um, for end users, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it obviously has to be good enough to um, not make us kind of lose face, but 
it's um, it's a lot better to show the thing you're producing rather than talking about it. And we did this when we had a, a minimal working version. We presented it at a couple of conferences and, and got a good level of interest that we wouldn't have if we had just spoken about it. And this kind of runs contrary a bit to uh, the, the more academic approach um, where you kind of want to tinker with it um, until it's absolutely perfect. Um, and then when you go and give it to the end users, you realize it's not what they ask for and um, you think it's perfect when no one else does. By the way, I'm, I come from an academic background, so I've seen it from both sides. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's um, yeah, it's it's working well, this approach, and it got us far better feedback than um, had we not done it this way. Uh, we're also not pushing a final product to customers. Um, so it's not a kind of take it or leave it. We want to go on a, on a journey with them to sort of understand um, their requirements and let them know that um, we can adjust it. We can tailor it to the specific crop, to the specific location um, that they're operating in. But we do have to have a, a viable financial model or a financial resource commitment from prospective customers. So in simple terms, uh, there has to be enough money um, and we have to get paid for it. And um, the, sorry, yeah, we have to get paid for it. And there has to be enough money in the model for us to make a bit of money for the partner to um, get some benefit from it. And also for the farmers themselves to have some benefit from it. So we need to make sure this alignment is here from the start because we don't want people there getting something for free. Um, that once we've got kind of buy-in from that stage, we then go to survey the partner. So um, we need to initialize the model with the local information. So this is surveying the agronomists and the extension agents for information on yield, fertilizer costs, localize it in terms of uh, measurements of weight and area, et cetera. And then once we've done that, again, we want to get it in the hands of extension agents as quickly poss as possible. So um, we want to get feedback on this. Undoubtedly, there's um, things we've missed or haven't thought of when we've been creating it. So we want to be able to rapidly iterate and make improvements. We've got quite a small developer team and um, we're going through this uh, process at the moment and we can kind of push out um, new versions in, in, the, in a matter of days. Um, so yeah, that's an important part. And then ultimately, um, once we've, perfected that side of things we go for an mvp launch so this is a small scale tends to be for single figure thousands of farmers um, to validate the approach and we're currently um, working on this with uh, for maize farmers in kenya with one acre fund and we're also working with um, some um, aggregators for sunflower and coffee um, so that is the virtual agronomist. Again, quite a, a quick tour for you. Um, I'll just end on saying a plea, really. If you have any soil or field trial data that you would like to um, include uh, in ISDA soil, then please share it with us. It's an open access resource, and we think this is the best way to keep it, uh, to make sure the entire community benefits from it. And also, um, if anyone likes would like to test a virtual agronomist with a network of farmers, um, please, please get in touch. Obviously, we're a commercial organisation, but we're looking for kind of proof of concept in countries around Africa. Um, I know there's a QA and a session after this, but if anyone has any questions they can't ask, we've got um, the email address here, info at Okay, I will end it there. Sorry if I was over time. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Matt. Great. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And also, Alice, uh, as well. You know, this is, you know, really, I think, solid work that you've been doing. Really great presentations. And also, uh, I think, really important to see a lot of these products that have moved beyond the academic and into the implementation and uptake. So that, I think that's really quite a, a unique thing that both of you are, are contributing towards. So um, let's go through some questions and, and pass the answers on to everybody. Uh, Alice, please look, Alice has, has done a great job of answering a lot of the questions for her. So uh, please look at the answered sections if you wanna take a look at that. Um, so the first one, I think this is to Matt um, from Sumashri. Uh, they ask, which crops does the virtual agronomist cover? Um, well, it's, 
Um, theoretically, it can cover a number of different crops. So um, under the hood, it's a very, very simplified version uh, of the QEFS model. But basically, if there's um, data available in terms of uh, agronomic efficiencies, then then we can we can use it. So the more um, field trial data, the better. Um, but that doesn't mean to say it can't be calibrated for um, for any crop, really. Um, so we basically at the moment, we're staying away from kind of uh, perennial crops except for coffee. Um, but many of the annual crops um, it can be used for. So at the moment, as I said, we're um, we've got it calibrated for maize. Um, there's a decent amount of um, field trial data. For example, there was a Tamasa project which um, generated a decent amount of data like that. Um, and as I said, we're also uh, calibrating it for sunflower in um, Tanzania um, and also uh, coffee in Kenya. Um, so the short answer is, yeah, there's, there's not a, a specific limitation to the type of crop. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Gideon Kruzman. He asks, smartphones require sufficient bandwidth and connectivity and availability of the smartphone. For resource poor areas, often remote, using virtual agronomists would be a challenge would be challenging. Have you given any thought to the increase in digital divide that you may be contributing to? Um, yeah, I mean, we we basically want to be able to get this digital data into the hands of smallholder farmers. Um, and this is one way that we kind of see it can be done. Um, so for example, if if um, farmers only have SMS based phones, um, then it makes it slightly more difficult. Um, as I said before, it's it's the approach is technology agnostic. Um, this is the approach we have um, we've used to start off with, but that's not to say that it needs to uh, kind of stay like this. We we're we're proving out the approach. As I said, we're kind of early on. Uh, we're we're getting tech technological um, and technical proof of concept, but ultimately this could be expanded to uh, simpler forms of communication, uh, whether it be kind of IVR or even SMS. Um, but this is just initially um, the, way, the way we're going with it. So um, there's gonna be, if we're talking about digital information, I think there's always gonna be some level of uh, technology required, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a smartphone. Um, so yeah. Hope, hopefully we're not doing that. Thank you. Uh, the next one from uh, Manuel, who provides information from the, from the farmer? Do farmers enter the information uh, in the app or in person on the ground and who works with the farmer? And that's to you, Matt. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> so I was reading one of the comments. Could you repeat? Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Who provides information from the farmer? Do farmers enter the information in the app or in person on the ground? And who works with the farmer? Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, so it's a uh, it's an extension agent um, uh, who who basically does a survey with with the farmer. So the extension agent will go and visit the field um, and they will uh, ask various questions of the farmer. Again, the farmer doesn't need to know the answers to all of them, um, but the extension agent puts the information from the farmer um, into the app and then delivers the advisory. Um, also probably important to note that uh, this app will be able to work offline in future. Um, so it's not constrained to internet connected locations. Um, so basically the only thing that needs um, to query an external service is, um, is to soil. Um, so basically what we can do is in the, in the smartphone app, um, the, the, if the user knows where they're going ahead of time, the extension agent, they can effectively cache that soil information before going offline, and then it will be completely functional um, offline. Great, thank you. So that, that's all the questions that were listed in the in the question and answer box. Please, uh, all the partic the uh, yeah participants, please uh, put any more uh, questions into the chat box, and we'll get them covered. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for for both Matt and for uh, for Alice. So having worked with with data, you know, across multiple different content continents and and projects and and different types of data in the past, you know, data quality has been 
a consistent issue, you know, especially if we're working with spatial data, you know, you could have the quality issues of, of you know, some, you know, you know, values, your whatever primary values you're getting from the data being an issue, but also locational issues. You know, maybe a, a good chunk of the data is, is not usable, at least from a locational perspective. So um, maybe for the both of you then, have, have you both encountered this? And if so, uh, what are some of the ways that you've looked at to maybe be able to use or filter through, uh, you know, poor data quality and, and assess which ones are usable and which ones aren't? And then as you move forward, what kind of institutions or what kind of systems are you guys putting in place to ensure that the data quality uh, is improved? Uh, maybe I can take a shot of that first. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's always a problem, um, especially the, the um, GPS is one which isn't always um, apparently obvious. Um, although we did actually um, encounter a situation where uh, there was a smartphone app collecting data which was rounding um uh can't remember if it's latitude or longitude to a to a whole number um so then when we plotted it on on a map there were kind of lines of data so um there's there's some obvious um things you can do so um obviously that is a, an extreme case but because we always work with distributions of data rather than single values in our approach it makes it slightly more robust to outliers. So for example, yeah, you can imagine your kind of classic bell curve. Um, we know that based upon thousands and thousands of data points. So um, we're generally using those distributions rather than um, a single value. We then know if a single value coming in falls way outside that distribution, it's it's probably erroneous. Um, so yeah, we, we have um, various ways by comparing it to the, the bulk of data that we always have. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not always a, a straightforward task to uh, so, to solve. Yeah, um, I share a similar experience with Matt. So we we um, have to check a lot of the data that are collected in the field, um, and also the reason why we do a lot of capacity building and training to the, or to train our data collectors. Uh, uh, in the work that we're doing for the pest surveillance, we have to train them on the identification of the pests and diseases because if they identify wrongly, then they will put in uh, the wrong values, for example. Um, we do a lot of data checks and we do verification. Um, we remove some of the data that we think are um, are, are not correct. So location is, is relatively easy because we also ask additional information. So not just rely on, on GPS readings, but also ask place names. Um, so they have to include that as well. So with this ones, we can eliminate those that are far uh, are not located near certain areas or are you know registering very uh, weird uh, shapes uh, when it comes to fields, for example, and those are uh, reviewed and uh, checked and verified. So we, uh, as part of PRISM, there is a data verification uh, method that is in place to make sure that all the data that are coming in are um, correct because also we provide validation. So we do a, an accuracy assessment that is attached to the data that are provided to the DA. So of course, if the locations are wrong, then the accuracy assessment will also have problems. So also there are data checks in place to make sure that we um, are using uh, good data as much as we can. Now, of course, we cannot um, we're not able to detect everything, but uh, to a certain extent, we're able to, to check uh, the data that we are using. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Uh, it just reminds me of one more thing where we had a load of field registrations. We plotted them on a map and they're actually in someone's house. Um, so we realized that we maybe had some slightly lazy extension agents. Um, so again, we had some tools to uh, kind of see whether it's slightly in, slightly in a field and also if there's two locations which are within, say, five meters of each other, it's probably suspicious. Right. Yeah. Thanks for those answers. Uh, the next question I have for you, both of you, is, you know, coming from an academic perspective, uh, setting up sort of academic analytical pipelines is relatively straightforward, especially with some of the, uh, you know, more recent tools for analytics, such as R or, and or Python. And, uh, but there's a very different sort of set of approaches that you need to take if you're trying to operationalize, you know, analytical pipeline. 
right? Because both of you are, are churning things, not from an academic perspective, but looking at, at making this a, an actual function service that gets updated, uh, you know, periodically. So what were some of the challenges that both of you faced moving from, you know, an academic type setting to functionalization and operationalization of, of, uh, of your analytical pipeline? And then could you maybe describe some of the approaches that you took to kind of address those issues and, and, and make it, you know, more sustainable in the long term? Maybe I should answer first. Um, so um, one of the things that we had to make adjustments are um, in terms of data collection, for example. So for, for an academic exercise, you have like very uh, defined sampling scheme, right? So you you have to collect uh, and, and randomize and so on. We had to make that adjustment uh, in our project because initially we did that and, and the extension uh, people who are collecting the data on the ground said, okay, we cannot do this. We have a lot of other work we are doing and we cannot go to these places, for example, for to do pest uh, surveillance. We cannot do this every month. You know, it's very, very far from, from each other. So we have to make adjustments because it has to be workable. We cannot do this ourselves. So it has to be done by extension people who have already a lot of work uh, in their hands. So we work together in terms of identifying how best and a minimum um, data that can be collected that could still be useful for our purpose. So. Um, there's a lot of interest now because some of the locations are saying, oh, we want also pest surveillance data in our location. So with that, we're trying to train more people, so extension workers in those particular areas to be able to gather other data. Now, for pest surveillance, for example, um, it doesn't mean that there's no pest uh, um, alerts happening in those locations. There are none everywhere else. No? So, so um, and there's a lot of interest being generated now as a result of data that are coming in so some are, are interested to have also to set up uh, some sites in, in their location but but a lot of adjustments have to be made because as i mentioned this is an operational system and something that they will be doing not as part of an academic exercise but as part of their regular jobs Um, sorry, hopefully you can hear me. I'm in the UK and unsurprisingly it's raining and I'm next to a window. Um, if you can't, let me know. Um, but yeah, uh, just, to, just to really echo what Alice is saying that um, it's always a trade off between kind of academic accuracy um, and the desire to make something as good as possible versus um, in the real world kind of operationalizing something. Uh, what's, what's good enough to uh, give the desired result? Um, so often you have to make compromises between um, kind of what between accuracy and what what might be desired in in a perfect world. Um, so, for example, for in creating the virtual agronomist, uh, as I mentioned, the model was kind of uh, a, a quest based model, but we found that was vastly over parameterized in terms of uh, the data requirements and what data it needs to to work and you just can't get all of that data for a location that isn't a, a carefully controlled field trial um, in the real world it kind of it's it's more difficult to to run so we had to again simplify um that approach to make sure that um it was workable for us um yeah and then just again really making sure that now, offline functionality, everything has to work um, offline effectively in, in our situation because we can't guarantee internet connectivity. Um, and just, just simplifying things, often the, the problem that you might find most academically interesting is not the problem your customer wants you to solve for them. Um, so you again have to um, do, do the thing they're asking you rather than do the thing which you might find interesting yourself. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Great. Yeah, thank you both. Um, so maybe Daniel, passing it off to you for wrap up. Yeah, let's wrap up. Thank you. Thank you both. So thank you, uh, Alice and Matt. Thank you for the presentations and, 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 and the way how you responded to the questions. Thank you very much. So one of the goals of this webinar was, um, uh, you know, to know how digital tool can be, how digital data can be turned into actionable data-driven agronomy insights. I think we got a couple of great examples of it. 
And as, Dave, as David said, like how to move from the academy to a real uptake. And with Alice, I'm still amazed by the fact that the CGIR data driven, that the CGIR data driven tool is envisioned to be part of a national program. Like this is really like moving from data to policy recommendations, going all the way up from remote sensing data to actionable insights, advice, even targeting varieties, uh, field specific recommendations. So we should definitely uh, highlight more of this type of impact achieved by some of the digital initiatives achieved by the CGIR. And Alice even said that one of the tools I, I, I think was right, the rice management was adopted last week by the Department of Agriculture. I mean, this is something that we should be very proud of it. You know, like I, in terms of the CGIR, this is really related to, to, to what we are doing in terms of research for development and even to achieve uh, the mission of the organization. And I also really appreciate that you shared with us some lessons learned, like the code development, the mapping out of the stakeholders, the capacity building, which I would say that is kind of common to many of the digital innovations that we know. But, uh, and it, even it was highlighted in our first webinar when we talk about design thinking and human centered design. And Matt, uh, he showed us another great example of how to turn agronomy data into actionable information and using data, um, um, soil data that the CGIR should be familiar with, like the AFSIS project where the CGIR, CGIR was involved at some point and, and using such data to provide recommendations on fertilizer rates and with the virtual agronomies going all the way from the recommendations to the expected, the expected profit. So he highlighted something that I consider is very important and is a challenge that is common across the regions in the developing world. Uh, and, is, and that is that the vast majority of farmers do not have access to agronomists, extension agents, technical assistance or whatsoever. And, and he highlighted that big data and digital extension or digital tools in agriculture are not a replacement of extension agents, but a complementary solution for doing their job much more efficiently. And he also touched on something that the big data platform has been promoting uh, as it is the open data, fair data, how to access to data. He even showed an API, by the way, how to access to API. So we've, we've been complaining on how to pull out information from these resources. So there you go. Uh, we, we, he even shared with us a, an a API, the API that we've all been asking for. Uh, so Matt said that virtual agronomy is going beyond fertilizer recommendations. And that kind of led to our West, next webinar. So we want to share with you, just give me one second. We want to share with you an infographic here in the chat of an infographic that we have released recently, working with another communities of practices and digital green. So um, recalling what, what Matt was saying, one of the findings of that infographic is that the extension agent of the future or the virtual agronomies should uh, think beyond um, sustainable, sustainable crop production, sustainable productivity, uh, and try to consider more in our case of the CGIR, right? Like now that we move into the food systems is to consider more kind of a farm to fork approach. So I, I'll suggest to stay tuned because our, our next webinar will be focused on, the, on that infographic where we have speakers from the educational institu institutions, young extensionists, so please don't miss it. So with that, and it's already nine o'clock here in Colombia, <laughs> I would like to thank to all of you uh, for participating in this webinar and special thanks to Matt, Alice and David. Thank you very much and see you in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Bye-bye.